Right, guys. Welcome to my session. So this is uh, using Microsoft Active Directory across on-premise and AWS Cloud Windows workloads. A um, little bit of a mouthful. Um, and <laughs> so um, my name's Justin Bradley. I'm a uh, specialist solutions architect for our desktop and app streaming. Um, I also moonlight in the Microsoft world and spend a lot of time working with directory services. Um, so this is why I'm kind of kind of here talking about the session today. So can I just get a, I can't see me, but can I get a, a, a show of hands? How many of you are running Windows workloads on AWS today? Okay. How many of those, how many of you are running Active Directory on AWS for those workloads? Okay, cool. So this will be interesting for everybody because there seems to be a mix of people that aren't and people that are and the various options we have. So let's kind of move this on. So what do we expect from this session? So the first thing is running Windows applications and workloads. Okay, so why do workloads need Active Directory? Um, fairly straightforward. At the end of the day, we all understand this concept that anything that's domain joined, it's being done for single sign-on. So it's an end user experience. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about the AD options for the cloud. So whether I'm talking to an on-premise Active Directory, whether I replicate to the cloud, or whether I'm going to use the Microsoft, um, sorry, use the AWS Microsoft AD, and we'll cover that shortly. Okay. Um, and at the end of this, we're going to kind of talk about the AWS Directory Service for Microsoft Active Directory Enterprise Edition. So again, another mouthful, but we call this Microsoft AD. So throughout this presentation, you'll hear me refer to directory services. If I say directory services, I'm talking about your directory or your directory running on EC2 for Windows. Okay. If I talk about Microsoft AD, I'm talking about the AWS service, Microsoft AD. Okay. Um, and then towards the end of this, we'll talk about the gotchas and what you need to watch out for when deploying uh, Active Directory on EC2. So we'll run you through the journey. So why Windows workloads need, you know, need Active Directory? So if you think about this, what we, as we said before, me as an end user, it's all about the end user experience. I'm logging onto my end device. Typically, it's a Windows device, or it could be a, a Mac that's been domain joined. And I want to access resources. I don't want to keep adding username and password every time I access various resources. Okay? So I'm looking at doing this for my corporate. I want to, you know, I'm managing thousands of client devices, thousands of server devices. You know, how do I manage these centrally? Okay? I mean, this is what Active Directory was designed for. It's been there you know, for several years, and it's designed specifically to allow you to manage this in a centralized, centralized purpose. So whether I'm looking at controlling policies, allowing access from an administration perspective or an end user, they're two different categories. And I can control all of this through Active Directory. So when we talk about options for the cloud, we're really talking about there's really three options, okay, and variants of those, but ultimately it comes down to three. So we're talking about domain joining EC2 instances to either an on-premise Active Directory or to a, you know, to a directory that's been deployed in the cloud or even to the AWS Microsoft AD. Okay? So if you look at this, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to run and manage services either in the cloud or on-premise. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about each three of the, all three of these and talk about what the architectures look like. So I'm going to show you the architectures, the communication flows, and why one is better than the other in terms of communications and the security around those. Okay? Um, one of the other things we'll cover a little bit later on around the AWS managed services is we have we spoke about Microsoft AD. There are two other products in that product suite, one being Simple AD, which is a Samba 4 compatible uh, directory, very, very simple. And there is the AD connector, which is a proxy server for authenticating against AWS services such as workspaces, uh, workmail, workdocs. Okay, so we'll cover those briefly. So let's kind of take a look at this. Now, really, what we're trying to look at is, well, this is a default function. Okay? So how many people in the room are running this architecture right now? So AD only on-prem, and everything is domain joined over the wire. Okay. So this is typical. So what you're seeing here is, as we all understand it, is I'm logging into my end user device. Okay? I want to authenticate, so I'm logging in. That authentication is happening via LDAP, Kerberos, certificates, whichever base is running. And this is all happening local to my local domain controllers. Now, when I access an application, which is the blue line you can see on this diagram, 
the blue line, I'm ultimately accessing an application. Well, as soon as I access that application, it's going to, again, because they're domain joint instances and an Active Directory integrated, it needs to authenticate that ticket, that Kerberos ticket or certificate, to ensure that what you're, you're able to access the application. So all of that traffic, which is the yellow line, is ported back across the, back across the wire. So whether that's a VPN or a direct connect. Now the challenges around this, of course, and this is a conversation I've had with lots of customers, is the number of ports you need to open for this to work. Okay? Active Directory, when you're running in this mode, requires a huge amount of ports. The ephemeral ports alone are several thousand. Okay? And then you have your Kerberos, your DNS, the standard directory services ports. And ultimately, because you don't know how fast you're growing and what you're deploying, most of the time, or most customers I've seen doing this, are actually deploying you know, a complete side of block. So they're taking the entire VPC range and saying everything that's deployed in there can access the AD on all these ports. Okay? Now, when you think about it, applications are chatty, so desktops are extremely chatty. Applications such as Exchange, SharePoint, every time I log in and doing so, are very, very chatty with Active Directory. So over the wire, there's a lot of traffic. Okay? So if we move on to next option. Okay. So here we can see that you've now got, we're talking about running Active Directory on EC2 for Windows. Okay, so here you can see we've, we've actually deployed right on the right-hand side. Um, so you should be able to see those up there. Domain controllers. Now you have two options here. I'm either going to run it in the default mode, which is I'm just going to extend my directory to the cloud. Okay? So I'm extending my domain from on-premise into the cloud. Okay? The other option you have there is to run it as a, what, what was commonly known as a resource forest and create a trust. Advantages is, of course, it's all under your control. You manage that entirely. Okay? Now, unlike the previous version, what you're now seeing is the authentication traffic is slightly different. So now I'm actually logging in from my end device. I'm accessing an application, whether that's the .NET apps, whether that's SharePoint, et cetera. All of that application traffic is now local. So when, when, when applications need to do domain control lookups, global catalogs, check the users, do Kerberos, it's all local to the local domain controllers. Okay? So using this model, um, so I've heard a lot, so I've had lots of conversations with customers, and one of the things that comes out this model a lot is the amount of time it still takes for a user to log on. So has anybody here in the room experienced long log-on times when running in this model? No. If you are, it's because of sites and services, and we'll cover that a little bit later on. Um, so we have a lot of customers that have been helping troubleshoot on this, and it's typically just because of configura misconfiguration. Okay. So when we move on and we're looking at, well, what is the third option we spoke about, which is the Microsoft AD, okay? Now, I'll go into the full details of what that really is in a moment, um, but ultimately what we're doing is it's a fully managed service. So you're deploying a managed AD in AWS, and in this sense, it is a forest, okay? So you're creating a resource forest, which you trust with your domain, okay? And the exact flows we'll go through shortly. Now, at this point, what's happening with the authentication traffic is slightly different. My applications still reside in the cloud. They're still do with domain joined. So now I have separations of roles and functions, be that, uh, be that my users which I own or be that the compute resources which reside in the cloud. So I can now separate these out. Okay. So at the authentication level, same process. I access the app. I'm logging in locally. I'm accessing the application. And then the application is domain joined in the cloud. So when it does its authentication, it's ultimately doing the authentication via the trust. Okay, so Active Directory is going to go across the trust, verify the Kerberos ticket, allow access, and off you go. There is a fourth option which we didn't really kind of bring in earlier on, and this is for those customers that are all in in the cloud, which really don't have much on-premise. And at this point, you know, you've got a complete architecture here which consists of multiple stages for Windows. So we're looking at remote desktop gateways to allow you know, secure access into the platform for administration. Um, you're deploying your applications in the middle tier, for example. And here we have the Microsoft Managed Service. So we're talking about Microsoft AD. Now, at this point, we can bring in other AWS services into the fold. So items such as RDS for SQL Server. So if you're looking at running Microsoft SQL Server as a managed service but AD integrated, this is how you would do this with Microsoft AD. If you're looking at running a desktop as a service, so if you're looking at, for example, workspaces, there's a prime use case for this. 
So let's kind of look at the, um, the different workloads and, and where they sit and where they reside and what your benefits are here. Okay? And then we'll talk about how you choose the right one. So if we look at this, you're looking at multiple options. So if I compare on-premise AD versus Microsoft AD, what am I really looking at? Well, if I'm using on-premise, I own the hardware. I manage this operating system. I have the operational overhead and the costs. Okay? Um, you need to define the high availability and ensure that it's always available. Okay? There is, as we said earlier, a lot of ports to be open to support this. Okay? And I said, but it's the, it's the most control. It's the, one, it's the model that has the most control for you as the customer. Okay? If we compare that to the Microsoft AD side, well, operational management is managed by AWS. So what does that mean? Well, we are deploying that across availability zones, so we ensure it's highly available. Um, we ensure that it's security patched. Okay? We're taking snapshots okay, every, tw every 12 hours, so we're able to restore. Okay? And any time any machine is, it goes down, it's monitored, so we're able to bring it back up. Okay? As I said, built-in redundancy. From a networking perspective, you only really need to enable the trust ports and DNS connectivity. Okay? And admin control, so this is a key point here. Unlike EC2 on Windows, so AD on EC2 for Windows or on-premise AD, you do not get full domain admin rights on that directory. So this is a key point here. So you actually get delegated control access. So one of the things you'll find out shortly is when you create it, you create a domain name. The net bias of that domain name is, an o, is exactly an OU, which is created inside of Microsoft AD. And you have full delegative control under that. So you can create users, groups, policies, you can create your own groups and do an additional delegation of control. Okay? Um, after all, it is a managed service. So at that point, you don't get the same level. And we'll go through the benefits of both in a moment. So how do I look at choosing the right one? Okay? So it really comes down to what your end workloads are. Okay? So if you're looking to minimize cost, reduce your operational overhead, and not have to manage an Active Directory inside of the cloud, inside AWS, then the Microsoft AD is a good way to go. Okay? It supports additional services such as RDS for SQL Server, which we see lots of customers wanting to use. Okay? It also supports the enterprise application, so whether that's workspaces, workmail, workdocs. Okay? And it also supports off the bat, as you'd expect, domain joining EC2 instances, no matter what they are or where they reside inside your structure. Okay? Um, one of the things that Microsoft AD doesn't support is it doesn't support Schema extensions. Okay? So if you're looking to deploy Exchange or SharePoint, SQL Server always on that require Schema extensions, so access to the domain controller, ability to update code, run code, um, then you can't choose Microsoft AD. It's not supported at this time. The difference here, or the exception to the rule there, is if you're running .NET applications that you've custom built, if they, are, if they require custom attributes to be created inside of the Schema, we allow you now since, uh, I think it was November last year, you can now create an LDIF file and have that uploaded in the console, which will then add all those parameters you need and attributes into AD. Okay. And of course, on-premises, on as we all know, it's, it's, you know, it's minimal. You don't need these two instances. Um, challenge you have there is latency, of course, so depending on where your data center is versus versus the AWS cloud, there's the latency aspects on here. So I mentioned that we'll briefly cover AD Connect just to kind of, kind of uh, complete the picture. So AD Connect uh, was the first product released before we came down, down the roll. And it's an AD proxy. So this actually proxies authentication for Amazon Workspaces, Workmail, uh, and, uh, and uh, WorkDocs. Okay? So what it ultimately does is as you log in, because each one of these products have a service broker in the front end and it will proxy the authentication request, the LDAP and Kerberos request, to your back end. Okay? Meaning that in the case of workspaces, the workspaces can be domain joined to your local, your AD, whether that's on-premise or whether that's an AD in the cloud that you've deployed on, on EC2 Windows. Okay? It's able to look up on-premises users and groups. Okay? And it's able, it's able to authenticate. So it's able to use your, your corporate credentials to do that. As I mentioned, supports EC2 seamless domain join. So like Microsoft AD, one of the things this does is it will give you a, an item inside of the console or via the CLI, and it lists it as a directory. Therefore, when I'm spinning up EC2 Windows instances, I can select that directory, and, I can t and it, it knows how to look up. It knows how to look up the domains, where it needs to be, and it's able to do domain joins for you. Okay. 
Um, and of course, customers intend to run Windows applications in the workloads at AWS. We say should use Microsoft AD. Um, again, it comes down to the choices of what you wish to do, right? Whether you're, whether you're looking at operational changes or whether you're looking at Schema. So depending on which one you're doing, really what this is trying to say is you should use an enterprise grade AD for, for your Windows workloads in the cloud, okay? AD Connector, whilst still available in regions, it doesn't have the same functionality or feature sets that you'd expect from an enterprise grade at um, Microsoft AD. So, kind of good segue onto Microsoft AD. So let's talk about what this really is and how it works for you. So, there's quite a lot on here, so I won't go through each thing, but ultimately, Microsoft AD is a Microsoft Server 2012 R2 Enterprise Edition running Active Directory. So as I mentioned before, it's not a homegrown product that's, that's utilizing Samba, for example. It is a true Microsoft Active Directory. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, AWS ensure that it's highly available. We monitor the platform. We ensure that software updates are done, that it's patched. Uh, daily snapshots. Okay. So all of these eliminate your operational overhead and allow you to concentrate on what's really important to you, the applications and the management of those applications. Um, as I said before, so we have custom administrated you know, users. So you get an OU structure. From that OU structure, you can go and create your local security groups, global security groups, populate those. So if you have the trust in place, you can populate those with admins out of your domain so you can do enterprise class uh, crossover, allowing you to administer the domain from remote. Okay? And as I said, it enables the use of the application services. It's also very, very easy to set up, and we'll go through that in a moment. Okay? So whether I'm using, uh, whether I use the console or the CLI, I can do it in both roads. Okay. So if we look at this, what we're really talking about is Microsoft AD as a resource. It says domain here, but it's ultimately a resource forest. It's a single domain as a single forest. Okay. So when you spin this up, assuming you're not all in the cloud, um, you're going to be creating a trust. And we go through the final architecture on this in a moment. But ultimately, we're saying, well, Let's establish a one-way trust between the two, between us and the corporate network. So we, AWS, trust the customer, you. Okay? You, the customer, do not trust AWS. Therefore, you have the true separation. The identity is you. The servers and services are belonging in the cloud, which is where they should be. Okay? Um, so domain users will access, will, will look exactly the same as they do today. So me as an end user, I see no difference. If the application resides in the cloud, the trust is in place, as I access that communication will flow, and it's the same seamless, seamless view that I have. Okay. Um, the exception here is kind of interesting. If you have your applications built that need access to on-premise resources, so be that printers. I mean, I've, have, I've got customers that have applications running in the cloud that print to large, large uh, printing devices that are domain joined on-premise. Okay? At that point, you will need to have a two-way trust. Because again, it's about the authentication process and who trusts who. Okay. If you do go down that route, then you need to consider things like uh, SID and, and SID filtering, um, and ensure that you're doing correct filtering on the, on the network, so only certain accounts or certain systems are allowed to actually authenticate across that trust. So here's a kind of, um, here's a, 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 a diagrammatic picture of how this looks. So remember what I said, we have here, we have our directory, which is on, the, which is on premise and I have my forest which is in the cloud, so this is the Microsoft AD. At this point, as I said before, all of my objects, so all of my computer objects, in this case EC2, EC2 Windows, um, for example, EC2 Linux can also now be domain joined, okay? Where I'm using RDS and my MSSQL, where I'm using workspaces, all of these objects are controlled separate from your on-premise. So I can actually create separate group policies. I can apply different policies in the cloud to what I have on-premise. Um, and as long as I don't enable loopback, um, then you're actually able to keep them very, very separate. Okay? So if you look at this, you see the, the one-way transitive trust. What we mean by that is because it's a forest-to-forest -forest trust, if you're running a root forest with child domains or a root forest with tree trusts or tree domains, you'll be able to enumerate all the users and devices within any of those domain structures. Okay? So just a quick show of hands, kind of useful for me for, for some work we're doing right now. How many people in the room have a, um, uh, are using uh, a root forest with tree, tree domains? Okay. 
And how many are just a very, very flat AD structure, single domain, single structure? Okay, cool. So it's a good question for some stuff that I'm working on at the moment, so it's kind of useful for feedback. Okay. Um, again, so just find, kind of finalizing this, we're talking about separation of identity and control. Okay. So how does this all work and how do I set this up? Okay. So I've only shown the console piece here because, well, at the end of the day, it's Windows, right? Everybody's used to doing the GUI. Yeah. So in this case, it's directory services. I go to the directory services console. I select directory services. You know, I select, select set up directory. And at this point, I select which directory I'm talking about. In this case, we've said Microsoft AD. I deploy that Microsoft AD and I configure it. And when I configure, it's fairly straightforward. I just need to give a domain name. Uh, a NetBIOS name that's associated with that domain if I need it to be different than what's auto-generated. And I also need to tell it which VPC, so which one of my virtual private clouds do I want to deploy this into? And of course, which subnets? You cannot deploy it unless you specify two subnets. And those two subnets must be in different availability zones. Okay, the console will error if you try to do it any other way. This is the way it ensures and guarantees that when it comes up that it's highly available across two availability zones. At the same time, once it's spun up, it creates all the security groups required to make sure that functions correctly. So there's a security group on there that says allow the ports inbound, so for, actually, you know, for systems to be able to connect. And there's an outbound policy at the time of deployment says nothing is allowed. Okay? So one of the things to remember is if you're thinking of doing you know, trusts, you've got to do conditional forwarders, you need DNS to be able to talk, you need to go back in and edit that security group to enable that communication. Okay? And typically, you you connect it so it only works to the specific directory servers on your on-premise or what you've deployed on these two windows. So this is pretty much through the console. Remember, though, you can do all of this through the AWS CLI and through the PowerShell SDKs. So you don't have to do this manually. So just really need to cover a couple of known limitations with regards to uh, Microsoft AD at this point in time. So some of them I've already mentioned, but ultimately we do not support LDAP-S right now. Okay? Something being worked on, but it's not supported to date. So if you require LDAP-S to run this, then again, it's another criteria for you guys starting to use, uh, you know, using AD on, it on, on EC2 for Windows. Of course, if you're really interested in this functionality, you know, reach out to us, reach out to your account teams, and, and we'll be able to walk you through and talk to you about in more detail as to when and how we're going to implement that. Um, support for more than 50,000 users. Um, now, I have customers using more than 50,000 users, but officially it's only supported for 50,000 users, and that's simply a scaling item. Right? It's about how many global catalog searches and how many, how many user objects can I really read at any one time. Uh, the more users I have, the more traffic I have, uh, the higher the requirement on the underlying hardware to support that. So one of the things that's gonna look, you know, we're looking at doing there moving forward is, is auto-scaling of the Active Directory, so bringing on more nodes to support additional capacity. Okay. Um, so if we talk about applications not really supported right now, what we're really talking about, as I said earlier, is applications that, are, that, that require elevated permissions. So if you need to do schema extensions, if I'm installing Exchange, I can't run the AD prep commands to, to install Exchange, it's just not supported. Okay. Um, so AD Federation Service. So yes, there are some limitations at this point in time. This, we expect to change over, over a period of time. Um, that's where we are today. So in summary for the Microsoft AD, and then we'll move on to uh, AD on EC2, okay? What we're talking here is we're talking about managed domain control, as I said, fully available, automatic patching, replication, is all controlled by us, okay? It's very easy to set up via the console or the SDKs and you get delegated controlled access so you can control permissions and usage, okay? Now, there's an interesting piece here, and that is that there is, if you've not used this yet, there is a free trial, okay? Be careful not to confuse this with the free tier, okay? So free trial meaning that you'll get 750 hours of usage after which you will pay, okay? So if you spin one up for the first time, you've not done this before, the first 750 hours will be free. So if you wanna do some testing, build things up, this is one way to do this relatively cheaply in a, in a short space of time, so proof of concept kind of phases, okay? So let's talk about AD on EC2 for Windows, okay? So we covered the Microsoft, the managed service, now we can talk about how would you do this and what are the gotchas. So what we're looking at here from an Active Directory perspective is, well, 
if I'm deploying AD myself on Windows 82, I need to cover things like DHCP. I need to control the IP ranges. I need to control DNS, uh, domain name suffixes, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot to configure. Um, I need to manage the availability. Um, I need to configure sites and services. Again, remember, it's all linked in with the directory piece. Okay? Uh, domain joining instances. Now, I can't auto domain join instances on my own EC2, so that's only supported if using our service. Okay? You could, but you'd have to automate the process of domain join, which means you're saving usernames and passwords. It's not a great way to do it. Okay. Um, and of course, if you're looking to support en you know, AWS enterprise apps, so how do we do this? So we're going to cover a few of these. So, okay, so, we'll so Active Directory instance on EC2, and we'll go through the architecture shortly. Um, here we're talking about it's the customer's responsibility. So where we say with the manage that we manage all those items, it's the customer responsibility for patching, so for the snapshots, ensuring you've got high availability. Okay. Um, security groups, you know, you've got to make sure that they allow the traffic in the directions you need, network access control lists. Okay. You need to make sure that sites and services is properly configured, including site costs. The site cost is the key here. Okay. Um, and remember, the way it works in terms of globalization is next local. So depending on the cost, you need to configure so that if I have resources in the cloud, they should authenticate against the cloud directory. If I have resources on premise, they should authenticate on premise. If on premise is offline, well, where does it go to get the net? Where's the next closest hop? You know, I don't want all domain controllers to be, re to be returned when I do a server request, a service request, to find out the SVR records. You know, if I get all the, all the records from everything and it's round robin, Effectively, my on-cloud could, could authenticate against on-prem. My on-prem could authenticate against cloud. Okay. Um, again, this is the use case that supports the uh, schema extensions, okay. such as Microsoft SQL Server, if you're using always, about, always on availability groups, if you're using SharePoint Exchange, Link, for example. So one of the things that, that quite often people miss when they start doing deployments of this type is they forget that Inside of the Amazon VPC, there are these items called DHCP option scopes. Okay? So per default, when you spin up any machine inside of Amazon, Amazon VPC, it's always DHCP. So every machine is a DHCP. It's almost a DHCP reservation. So when you spin up a machine, it gets a DHCP IP address, and it keeps it for the life, of the life cycle of that machine. So when you destroy it, the IP is released. Okay? So one of the things it does is if you don't do anything, it's configured to use the AWS defaults which means from a DNS perspective, it's always going to get whatever the default compute dot um, region is, and it will also get the local DNS server addresses. Okay? So in VPCs, the local DNS address is always the first, is the second IP address of the side range. Okay? So we'll always use this. So by creating a DHCP option scope, I want this to point to my AD. So in this case, let's say I've deployed, you know, I'm deploying AD on, to, on top of WC2 for Windows. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I've already deployed it, I've created it. It's got its own domain name. It's got, it's, you know, it's got a, a static IP because you need to convert it. Okay? And now I need to edit the DHCP option scope, and I need it to match those functions. So here I'm going to go in. I'm going to go and give it, in this case, I've said AWSLabs.net. I'm going to create the domain name. I'm going to tell it where the name servers are, what the NTP servers are, uh, NetBIOS name servers in case you're using WINS, and the NetBIOS node type. So here it's always two. Okay? By doing this, it now means that any machine that I fire up inside of Amazon VPC, doesn't matter whether it's Windows or Linux, any EC2 instance or any instances that are fired up inside of that will always get this DHCP information. So it knows how to contact your AD. It knows how to, how to do domain registrations when you start. Okay, so key. So we kind of touched on this around an AD forest spanning AWS and the corporate data center. So in this case, I kind of use London and Paris as, a, as part of the corporate. So I have two domain controllers. Typically, you're going to have more. And now I've got an availability zone in the cloud. I've drawn this simplicity, simplistic at the moment, so there's, not, so there's no high availability in here, but it's, it's implied. Okay? So I have this design. Okay? So I've extended my AD. So what happens, what happens when my domain controller in the London region is down, or my London office is down? Well, what happens to my end users? Which domain controller do they access? Remember, if I do a SRV record lookup when I'm logging in, it's going to return everything. Okay? So one of the things I see a lot of is around sites and services, and a lot of deployments, you know, so in the larger deployments, they pretty have it locked down. But in the smaller ones, everything's in the default site. 
and the default side is what's going to cause you problems. Okay? So what do we really want to do? Well, really what we're trying to do is an architecture looks a bit like this. Okay? So you're really ultimately going to try and say, okay, I have my DC1, my DC2 for my locations. I have my, my, direct, my domains deployed in the cloud. Okay? And I'm going to configure sites and services. So now I'm going to create a new site, and I might just call this, in this case, call it AWS. And inside that site, I can split it down based on region. Okay? Now what I'm going to do at that point is I'm now going to go and configure um, subnets. So I'm going to add all of the CIDR blocks that are associated with AWS to that site, ensuring that any machine that tries to, any server or any application that wants to authenticate will always get the local records. Okay? By doing this, I also need to create the costs. Okay? So I need to ensure that the site links have a higher cost. That way, anything that's running, in this case, you can see I have you know, local, I've got a cost of 10, so it's nice and fast. Um, and between London and Paris, for example, you can see I have a cost of 50. So in our use case where London's offline, well, the first next step it's going to go to will be Paris in this case. You, know, you may find that in terms of your architecture, maybe AWS was the quick, would be the quicker one to go to. You really just need to look at your networks and figure out what's the best way to do that. Okay. So ensuring you do this ensures that the authentication stays local to where it needs to be. It also gets you around issues of slow logon times uh, and will ensure that as you move forward, you really have a much a better functioning forest inside of, your, inside of between AWS and, and your on-premise. So what are we doing now? So this is kind of an extension on top of the previous, previous design. So now I've got my on-premise data center with directories. I've extended it to the cloud. But I still want to make use of some of the AWS services. I still want to use RDS for SQL Server. I want to use workspaces or other, other, other services. So we now see customers doing exactly this, where they're saying, OK, well, I'll create a resource forest using Microsoft AD, so the AWS service, specifically for those, while maintaining the separation for everything else that I control. Okay. Again, it comes down to DHB ops and scopes and setting up the trust correctly. Okay. So I'm kind of coming towards the end now. Um, there's a few references on here. Um, so I'd recommend you go and have a look at some of the quick start guides. Um, we have quick starts around Microsoft AD, uh, Exchange, SharePoint. Again, all of these can be run isolated or joint. Okay? Um, there's various documentation on here as well. And from a uh, reInvent perspective, so these slides will be distributed afterwards, so you'll be able to find them online. Okay? Um, if you want to learn a lot more about what we can do in terms of Microsoft on top of AWS, I'd recommend looking at these five. So these are the five that I look at the most and recommend to my customers. Uh, these are reInvent sessions that were run in November last year, uh, covering you know, simplifying architectures uh, you know, at, a, at a 200 level, so fairly high level, right the way down to deploying your first 100,000 Windows users and deploying .NET and pipelines. So there's a, there's a, complete, there's a good mixture on here. So with that, thank you.